to start. Hello, everybody. We are very happy to welcome Monica Bello, Nicole Villiers, and Alan Tiana here at the Centre de la Photographie Genève in the frame of the parallel program of Cosmos Cosmos. Cosmos Cosmos is the sixth edition of the Cinquante JPEG, Cinquante Jours pour la Photographie à Genève, Triennial. Uh, it's a large group of exhibition that tries that invites uh, visitors to explore the diverse relations between Eros and Cosmos. Uh, and as we are also showing works by artists that are very interested in scientific environments uh, that are dedicated to understanding the fundamental structure of the universe, as for instance Gianni Motti, you might have seen his nearly six hours long video of him walking uh, along the entire 27 kilometer ring of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, or also the work by Linda Freni Nagla, an Italian artist that collaborated with the CERN physicist Michael Dozer, and they were trying to um, detect the annihilation of antimatter uh, with the help of photographic plates that they fabricated themselves. We thought that it might be uh, fitting to invite uh, the Arts at CERN residency. Uh, to further explore the links between science and art, or between art and science. Monica will introduce the two artists present. Later on, I'll say a few words about Monica's background. She initiated in 2007 and also ran the Laboral Centro de Arte in Gijón, in Spain, and then worked as an artistic director of VIDA, the Arts and Artificial Life Awards of the Fundación Telefónica in Madrid. In 2015, she took over the position as curator and head of arts at Sur here in Geneva, and she curated many exhibitions. Um, Monica's interests revolve around the question of how scientific practices, for example in particle physics or also in astronomy, can become resources of artistic investigations. She likes to see these investigations as open processes, open to the participation of a plurality of actors, and also open regarding the outcome of artistic practices, including the tolerance of failure and unexpected results. I'm very, looking, I'm very much looking forward to this discussion tonight called Fieldworks and presenting the exchange, the exchange residency Symmetria especially because it will be facilitated by uh, such an experienced critic and curator at the intersection between art and science, or more precisely, uh, basic science. Uh, so, join me in welcoming um, Nicole, Alan, and Monica. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Monica Bello, experiences of working in a laboratory as CERN, the largest laboratory in the world, the largest community, and to present what we do or what uh, the framework of uh, practice and uh, uh, with artists in a, a fundamental research environment. Um, i introduce very briefly what we do and uh, very briefly as well um, that, uh, with all the important that has for us symmetry. Symmetry is our late, latest program and experiment. And um, as Stefan said, we uh, run a number of residencies through um, the year, uh, bringing and welcoming uh, about 22 uh, artists from all over the world. We have different conferences through the year to participate in competition. And um, uh, perhaps um, I will refer to the very beginning on just to that moment when there was the realization that artists were knocking in the, in the lab stores. Uh, you have at the entrance, and uh, Stefan referred to it, the work of Gianni Motti, uh, walking and trying to become uh, a fundamental particle uh, by walking. 
walking and experiencing the, the effect and the effects that are, were uh, emerging through the, 20, the 27 kilometers circle, which is, as you, many of you might know, uh, 100 meters underground, next to the Jura Mountains, up in the city. So Gianni Motti uh, was uh, at some at the very, very, uh, very early stage of our program before uh, uh, was conceived as uh, the official program of the arts uh, and the way to engage with the artists at the lab. And uh, at that moment, as I was saying, there was this realization. It was not that we, from the top to the down, we decided to bring artists. The artists were already coming. Uh, before Gianni Motti, uh, even more uh, earlier, in, in the 70s, we have James uh, Lee Byers pointing up in the sky and trying to form in a site that was not what it is today. So through the years, artists were uh, usual users of the community environments. In 2011, there was uh, an official claim to, to set up an arts program in the form of residencies because for us the most important, and I think uh, Stefan said it in my introduction, that the, the experiment and the uh, setting up the good uh, conditions for things to happen will bring the unexpected and the uncertain. But this is very valid in an environment of fundamental research. So today uh, we have uh, two of the artists that are um, we are enjoying very much their company in the very warm summer weather in Geneva. But um, uh, we are enjoying uh, their company especially because when they are with us, we realize through their eyes and their experience uh, the value of combining different knowledge ways of seeing the world. Uh, I think uh, we were discussing this morning, we, we said really nice things. Sometimes it's difficult to articulate what emerges from the experience of being at the lab, but we were saying about how we are looking for the sparks in our imagination that help us to set up new questions and never answer. So we are looking for questions. Uh, well, uh, what this symmetria, let's get to the point. <laughs> symmetria is um, our latest creation, is a pilot presidency that is becoming really successful and amazing experience because it, uh, it is a combination between two locations, uh, two uh, sites of research and precision through contemporary science. And they are located here at CERN, and then the, and the second location is in the other part of the world. And, uh, uh, and this is in Chile, in the Chilean observatories, which, uh, if you have planned to go, please do. It's the only thing you have to do in life. <laughs> it's an amazing uh, place to, for research. Uh, so, uh, Symmetry allows invites artists from Switzerland and Chile to engage into this exchange, going into the deep uh, center of Europe, which is here at CERN, to think how to be engaged and imagine the, the world, of the most hidden world, the, the micro world, uh, through particle physics, and then later go to they are invited to go to the Chilean observatories in Alma, in the Atacama Desert, and in Paraná, and hopefully Brasilia as well, uh, which are all of them, the three of them in the north of Chile. And um, they get fit by uh, hiking <laughs> and going to the, to the mountain, but uh, they will uh, finally find this location, which is not a laboratory, it's a Observatory from where uh, scientists from all over the world are uh, uh, examining the universe and the knowledge that we have about it. So, symmetry consists from 
that co-hosting residencies in different locations that are usually really out of and, and uh, in, the, in the middle of nowhere and uh, usually not places where uh, you could imagine an artist. Uh, okay, uh, so um, I hope to show some images because I, I work, in my work I realized that we talk and sometimes we get used to not see anything. Uh, but by abstractions, we get super excited. <laughs> and uh, well, so I'm relying on the artists for the, the nice visuals and the, the imagination. But um, uh, before um, passing the microphone, I introduce Alain Bougana and Nicole Bellier. Alain Bougana, as you many of you know, is an artist from uh, based in Argentina, originally from Ticino. Um, he is totally obsessed about light, <laughs> very into light and photons. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, Alan works from the real to the speculative about the behavior and the dynamics of light and what we stand understanding. Uh, he develops really amazing and poetic tools to work with this interaction between light and the other matter. And the notion of what um, you call uh, digital organics, right? So uh, we invite Alan to, to start uh, there was, uh, this discussion about uh, looking at uh, dark matter, about the hidden things that uh, we are not interacting with, but we know is there, about measurement, about devices, devices and artifacts. Okay, so this is Alan. And uh, Nicole Lillier is uh, from Chile. Currently based in Boston in the MIT Media Lab. Uh, Nicole explores the intersection between art, music, architecture, science, and uh, technology. With all these tools, she is really uh, investigating the, the concept of performativity and the questions uh, about possible futures redefining how we see our environment and the other. So um, I pass the microphone to Alan and then to Nicole, and um, later, later, we'll have time for, uh, for discussion on questions with you. Thank you for being here. Great. I think I'm going to use, you hear me? Well, yes. great. <clears throat> so, I'm going to Sort of 
refractions generated by this mountain made of diamond. And his work has been inspired by like, sort of a discovery that where there's supposedly to be a planet somewhere uh, made in terms of diamond. And this is more like a, a digital hybrid than anything else. It shows some realistic behavior, but I don't know exactly what it is. And following this same logic, um, this other work from the following year, it's also like a video projection, um, and presented as more like a costly presence in an exhibition space. Where what you see, uh, it's also like a very short answer. Um, it's like a flag in the wind, simulated, where the flag behaved uh, as if it was made before made of water, then turned into plastic, then into diamond, and so on. Basically, I mean, I made the index of refraction. The idea was to see, observe how the folding of this textile would interact with the index of refraction, and it switched back and forth between like federation and abstraction without having a real control on it, so it was more like an experiment somehow. And similar logic, um, this video installation um, made with it's a, it's like a triple synced video installation, it looks like a fire pit, where I've been wondering uh, like a new age idea of what is a crystal fire, then let's visualize it. And Simulating as if a uh, flame flames um, with a dynamic volume would behave like quartz crystal. And this is the result, which is like this nervous effect that reminds water. So, all these phenomena that you can see are called caustics, which is like the natural um, uh, condensing of light by some translucent body, like this water, bed of water, because it creates caustics. It's this uh, dancing patterns that you see at the bottom of swimming pools. And alongside um, these works with software, I've been also sort of creating sculptures where I've been manipulating a different type of translucent materials and using also different treatments. And I've been doing a series of this type of works that you see here. Um, these are made of acrylic glass, which underwent two specific treatments, two specific aggressive treatments. Basically, um, so at the beginning the block was a block, and the first treatment basically it has been the block has been electrified, so that uh, even plexiglass become conductive. Electricity at a certain moment, and there is a, like a discharge lightning um, converging, and you see these fine roots in these blocks. This fine rooting uh, it's the silhouette, the three dimensional silhouette of a lightning, of a discharge lightning converging toward one point. And then, second treatment, um, I ask somebody to shoot uh, on the discharge point. And my interest was to see how this way of attacking matter would interact together to create um, these sort of organic objects which reminds minerals as well as mountains, knowing that mountains and minerals are not necessarily made that way. And I was like, building somehow a correlation between the digital and the analogical. In 2015, I started um, Exploring the medium of all, the obsolete medium of holography, I would say. So, I read the whole um, technique with chemicals and lasers and optics. And I've been making holograms of minerals, like in this case, a zoomorphic mineral from a collector that I borrowed. And I was very interested in a whole series of properties of holography because it says a lot about the behavior of light at a at a very deep level. And for this work, I would, I've been showing it uh, using uh, different laser lights, which basically recreates the object, the volume, the perception of the volume of the object 
repeated and overlapping. So also inquiring about our perception. And so this kind of medium also became obsolete because of the arrival of the digital image somehow. And another unique aspect of holography that I was very interested in is the divisibility property. Basically, if you break or cut uh, holographic plates and film in many pieces, each fragment of hologram will replay the whole image again, just from a narrower, narrower point of view. It becomes like a tiny window, which is something very counterintuitive to what we think about an image. If you kind of photograph in two, you have two parts. But holograms behave differently. And so I've been also making holograms of very basic models, kind of like, as you say, uh, the idea of a model uh, of a chemical of a chemical structure represented by a, a ball and a stick. It's how you present very often uh, molecules. And so I've been cutting and destroying holograms, and as well as making holograms of planets, uh, of models of planets. So playing with scales and putting connection micro and macro mediated somehow by this medium. And at the same time also work with digital holography um, for this work called Tilting Moon. Um, I've worked with a friend chemist, basically um, Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, who was also a biochemist. Uh, wrote a series of um, fake scientific papers uh, about um, a fictional uh, chemical compound called tiotimolin, saying that this compound would dissolve into water before it touches water. And so, through these scientific, fake scientific papers and some of my materials, with the help of these friends, we kind of created the hypothetical molecular structure of this fictional compound and presented it in the form of a hologram so that you can really contemplate somehow this fictional structure. Wondering also how to illustrate the, the atom of carbon that will travel through time because it dissolves before it touches water. In 2017, um, I had the idea to make again holograms and I wanted to like recreate um, the perception of, a, of stars, like making a hologram of a starry sky, starry night, that you are seeing a point of light in space. And while doing it, uh, I thought that it was more interesting to show the whole process of how to make this holograms of starry nights. Therefore, I did. I presented the whole lab with several tools. Here you just see one of the starry nights I've been recreating using like a laser, uh, light diffuse, and which creates this shimmer, shimmering and twinkling of the stars um, that with the light filtering through um, this motif, where basically I've been um, making holes in an aluminum foil. And with the, this sort of crops of um, starry night views are supposedly uh, the starry night views that there will be um, on the day of my birthday when I will turn 50. So this is like sort of a reminder for me to contemplate the sky. That's how to do it somehow. Uh, to like pollution and how living in a city kept me away from contemplating the stars. And this brings to last uh, work I wanted to present before talking about the residency. Last year I was invited to uh, make a mapping video for the facade of the Grand Palais building during the art fair. I had the idea to use 
technical computer fluid dynamics software to reinterpret um, somehow the facade of this Arugo building in which um, the architectural structure of the building becomes like a sort of a constraint through which illusory fluid would flow through and with, with vortices uh, somehow randomly arising here and there and misusing somehow this very technical software for mapping purposes and also building a bridge with cyclic events in, in some, to some extent. Symmetry. So, yeah, I've been exploring this great residency for, the, for more than one week so far. And so, through the different uh, exchanges with researchers and visiting of the experiments and facilities, I've been trying somehow to focus on some, sometimes the discussions on a series of topics like, again, visual computer simulations and wondering uh, if it's only a tool for proving theories and experiments uh, or, of, or also if it's, it can be a tool for stimulating intuitions or even for some forms of discoveries. Uh, what's the relationship uh, of simulations to reality? and Do they unveil a sort of an extended nature somehow? And as Monica mentioned, yeah, some light-related topics that I'm very interested in. Uh, imagining maybe a sort of history of light, I don't know how it could be interpreted, uh, knowing that, for example, there was like an early dark universe in the early phases of the universe where photons were somehow trapped. And so the universe was completely dark. Or also some other ideas like creating matter from light. Theoretically, it's super possible, and only lately there are some experiments going in the direction that make it concrete somehow. And also being like focusing on, on some type of materials called scintillators, uh, because there are sort of some visible detectors of invisible phenomena that scientists still use, as well as some light guides, which is which are the very big and folding structures. See, can see on the left. Next step, Chile. So some expectations or considerations. Well, I would say, yeah, experience like a unique environment, like starry nights and in a unique environment. Uh, inquire on, on where the two different research contexts, Serena and Iso, might rejoin, differ, or complement each other. Then, more, some more specific curiosity that can even answer about more deeply later, like the light laser guide star system and the creation of a, artificial reference stars, which are like tools used in these facilities to observe the sky, and other phenomena like gravitational lensing, because it's a form of caustic. It relates to the simulations I show you. Um, at the beginning, and it's actually a phenomenon that happened at an astronomical level. And it's also like one of the way of inferring the fact that exists dark matter in the sky. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's a great honor to be here. And really, this residency is it's like a dream come true. It's really amazing. Um, I'm Nicole. Uh, and as, I, as Monica said, I'm from Chile. And now I'm based in Boston while I'm doing a PhD. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my work and my process during this residency. So first of all, I wanted to introduce you to some concepts that I've been working with. Uh, for example, I work a lot with the concept of performativity drawing from the 
ideas and theories from Judith Butler in the understanding of performativity as what uh, as, as the coming into being and the construction of identity uh, and also in the terms of uh, Karen Barat where she takes Judith Butler's ideas and also thinks about post-human performativity. So what is the coming into being and the construction of identity of the non-human uh, subjects and how even objects have their own agency and identity in, in a dynamic way. So I, I am doing right now in my research um, some sort of uh, examination of this concept from the micro to the macro and with everything in between. Then this has a lot to do for me uh, with the concept of resonance, which comes from the idea that everything that is matter has the capacity of vibration and resonating. So we are all in this kind of like entanglement of, of like an, um, a vibrational ontology where everything is touching each other and related in this mesh that I call the membrane. Um, so I work a lot with transductions and different strategies for transductive realities. In this sense, I want to talk about connective and collective media to understand connective and collective intelligences. Understanding collective intelligences as a form of intelligence that can be multiple, that is outside of the brain, and that is not only human. Then I do this by using a main material like sound. That's what I most, mostly work with. I'm really comfortable in this vibrational reality. Then I like to understand sound, but sound does not really exist isolated, so sound is, exists in the space and also in the subject. In that sense, sound is polysemic, polytopic, and polymorphic. So I created this, what I call the sound, space, and subject conundrum, a triple S conundrum, and it goes a little bit like this. Sound in space in the subject, in space in sound. And goes round and round and round, it's a constant loop, like nothing exists without the other one, so you really like are entangled in this sonic reality, let's say. But then, what I like about this is that I understand this as something, it's not only a medium for communication, but it's a medium that creates collective rights and resonant rights. Uh, collective rights, I mean, it could be jam sessions, improvisations, trans rituals, listening to emerge together, rhythms and set cycles of the world, scores and choreographies of randomness, different types of dances, and I work these type of ideas through installations, uh, experimental composition, Genetic sculptures, sonic sculptures, listening sessions, sonic rituals, and trans also rituals. I'm going to talk to you about transactions and translations of matter, which is kind of like the overall umbrella topic that I give to my work in general. It has an ongoing experiment and exploration of sound as a construction material for identity, agency, and also spaces. So I'm going to I like to say that everything that I do tends to be some sort of listening exercise or maybe resonating exercise, but it's always mediated. Like, because of the medium that I work with, this obsession that I have with sound, I also need to deal with the apparatuses and all this mediated environment, right? So it's, it's, it's a problem and a benefit in its own. Uh, I work a lot with resonance and transaction, as I mentioned before. I, I tend to build my own tools. I build a lot of like contact mics, hydrophones to get closer to matter, to really like get it in this intimacy layer and dynamics with things. Uh, the piece that you can see here, that's, uh, that's an example of what I call transactions um, in the sense of understanding the material capacities of different bodies. For example, these concrete blocks, they have uh, trans transducers and speakers and sensors inside of them, and each of them is a voice in a eight voices choir, uh, a song that is composed by eight different uh, agents singing. The thing is that the, the calibration of the volume and the amplitude of this uh, choir doesn't travel through the air, as we to, through the airwaves, let's say. So to listen to each of these voices, you need to put your head in contact with the material. So the sound is really traveling and transducting itself in, in its own body, not outside of it. So the thing and the problem here, and I think the poetics, is that we can only access one of the voices simultaneously, while the, the composition is meant to be listened in the eight voices. So maybe you can access this in a, let's say, in a collective way, if there's eight people listening to this and then you share this idea. So it's again about a right of collectivity, right? Then I do a lot of like uh, communication and transmission uh, experiments. I work a lot with the idea of re reappropriating and incorporating the airways that are being like drastically regulated and institutionalized and uh, yeah, like it's it's been it's been tough for radio, like it's been tough for internet right now, right? 
So I really like to play with this item, that, uh, the, this, this media that is really like an infrastructure that defies the limits of what we understand by architecture, for example. So we can think with radio to create uh, invisible architecture, invisible infrastructures that transcend the notion of walls, for example. And how powerful would that be, right? Like if we can really use it with other regulations that we have right now. So I think building different radio devices, transmitter, receivers, transceivers, um, to build these systems and really create like invisible architectures that can travel and create mobile infrastructure. Um, I really work also in this sense, not only like communicating knowledge and uh, experiences from human to human, but I also try to create dialogues that are more transversal and touches on coexistence with also our non-human partners. So, for example, that one, it's a performance that I did in the Venice Architecture Biennale as part of the Lithuanian Pavilion uh, in the swamp. And I was gathering all the sounds from the swamp and these different like microorganisms and the sounds of the water itself and the ground and everything getting like this microenvironment, let's say, uh, and transmitting at four kilometers in the circle in place. So th these are these type of experiments. Then I do a lot of like uh, what I call telemetry and expression experiments. These ones are mostly to understand the uh, different sensors and ways of interacting with matter, uh, organic and non-organic, in different media. For example, I've been doing a lot of experiments in microgravity, creating different uh, musical instruments in microgravity, and understanding what would happen when in the instrument itself has the capacity to perform itself, and then the human body gets in a kind of like parallel level with, with this other body, and both are agents that, that, like let's say the instrument is not there to please us or to serve us, but we're there to have this dance and choreography together so we can emerge together. This, this one um, is one of the new instruments that I've been developing with my uh, collaborator, Sunsfish, and it's gonna be in a microgravity flight in two weeks from now. So we're gonna test again new instruments and see what happens. Can they really perform themselves? It's a series of three, and the idea is that they're gonna be like this um, microgravity uh, orchestra. Then, what happens with the, the idea of sound to create identities and agency in the sense that we can create new imaginaries to build the new normals? So sound, because it's detached from the visual, it really opens up a new layer, I mean, I think a more profound layer of uh, yeah. materiality uh, yeah. and the idea of that you can really project futures. So, this is a myth of the Mapunanta, which is uh, thinking about the indigenous cultures of the Mapuche uh, people in Chile and how we can think about the Mapu futurism touching on their cosmologies, uh, ancestral cosmologies relating to the skies and how they have been in the sky, outer space, before NASA, before uh, the Russians, before everybody. And then the idea of thinking about choreographies and dialogues about uh, multi species. Uh, across matter, uh, organic, inorganic, across life. Uh, so I've been working also closely to some microorganisms and extremophiles. In this case, you can see like a little tardigrade or water bear uh, with whom I share my desk in a uh, and with whom I'm trying to communicate through vibrations. Uh, I really like the tardigrade in the sense that I, start, I started working with them when I understood and knew that they were already an invasive species in outer space. So what does that mean? That they're also populating this place that we think is like empty, nothing is empty at all, right? Anyway, so an invitation to touch with sound, perceiving with vibrations, and to resonate and transcend. As I mentioned before, the concept of the membrane is central to my work. Uh, I want to say about this that for me the membrane is what synthesizes everything, this understanding of this vibrational reality, that everything resonates uh, in the sense that we can really create a bridge between the material and the material world through sound, where you can detach the sense from the, the, the imposition of the visual and create like this kind of like really strong imaginaries through sound and where in the membrane we're all, wanted or not, entangled in this ex uh, constant exchange of relationships. Then, in this thinking, I created this device that is called El Poema de la Fábrica Cosmica. Uh, this is an environmental sensing device, let's say. I like to think about it as some sort of, a, it, it's like a, like a parasite that takes over into some spaces and translates 
some sort of some, some environmental data into sound. So musicalizes the space and creates an imprint of what that space has to reveal. What are the agents that are constantly there for us, interacting with us, but we don't really pay attention to them. So it's kind of like a device that helps us uh, in this sort of like ritual of listening. Uh, it's a parasitic shamanic medium that is helping us connect with these other invisible and silenced voices. So I brought this one in here to, to CERN to start the, the experimentation scene. Uh, this very like, uh, kind of like extreme environments and, and highly uh, how can we, like highly apparatuses in the earth. So in Symmetria, the residency, we're working in CERN and Alma from the micro to the macro, and then I'm installing the Poema de la Fabrica Cosmica in both places. And my, what I want to see is what happens with the voices of these places in these very high-tech environments that are deeply, deeply rooted in nature. It's like we're basically places where nature and culture or technology and earth really collide. So this is a little like experimentation that I did with this device at the Alice experiment. Uh, the Alice experiment is the main experiment where they see uh, and observe uh, the uh, far gluon plasma phenomena. And let, let's listen for one minute, please. <laughs> of what happened there. There's no mix and it's like just like a rough cut of the first parts of the poem. Um, this is a poem, I forgot to mention that, because not only we're uh, sonifying the sensor data in real time, but also through my experience in CERN these days, I've been gathering like some key concepts and words and notions of, uh, so I, I, got, I made a list of words and what it's doing also this is converting some of these words uh, depending on the environmental conditions is bringing up some of these words. Uh, so this automatic poem is being generated, but that's the poem of the La Fabrica. We'll see how different is going to be the poem when it goes to Alma, right? And uh, it's... So other things that I've been like, super inspired in this uh, short stay at CERN, I mean, it's not that short, but it's been like really fast. Uh, I've been really, really inspired about conversations with different scientists. And in one conversation with a cosmologist, we talked about the cosmic microwave background which is it's fascinating. So it has to do with these primordial sound waves. Um, I'm just starting to get to know, familiar with this notion, so forgive me if I'm, if I'm not completely accurate with the physics, but the primordial sound white waves are actual sound waves that emerge when in everything in the universe, like right, right after the Big Bang, when we were, uh, everything was a, a, a hot mix of like plasma, uh, it started like, to ripple in itself, this matter. So we know that in, 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 in outer space in the universe, in the vacuum, some waves do not travel. But in this case, because of the collisions and the ripples of this material with itself, there were uh, some sound waves traveling in the material itself, which is fascinating. So this is the first time sound waves existed at all, and they created, because of this ripple and oscillations, they created an imprint in, in, in matter and light that we can understand now and really understand this is key for understanding the, our origins basically. So it's really exciting. And for me it's amazing that this is the origins of also sound waves. Then, but it's also like a bit an ongoing question, right? I'm thinking this relates a lot to the membrane, to this concept that I'm working with, how everything is entangled. So I think it's, it's like this quartz plasma 
it's our courtroom plasma times the origins of like our membranical thinking is it like do we have this membrane in, in, encoded in our history because of this moment that is basically part of like very first seconds of our origins in the universe so I think it's fascinating and I also think it's like no it's not like a real I mean might be a coincidence but I think there's something going on that the first time that the El Poema de la Fabrica Cosmica was performed and explored was in the Alice experiments where they are actually redoing the research of the quark gluon plasma. This was not planned, it kind of like happened. So, I don't know, I think it's pretty cool. Gracias. I think it's, it's very difficult to, to, to try to start a discussion because all, all the, I see that these ripples are yeah, going around us at the moment and the, this is really the goal of the presidency is that uh, there is some stage where you, you, you are just waiting for something to happen and uh, we have a lot of raw material to work. Um, you, you may agree that you are at this moment, at this stage in which something might come up and become an inspirational topic, as in, in, in the case of the uh, quark plasma research in Alice or the, well, the, the finding is like a symbol of fake scientific papers, which I find really fascinating. So um, we have, um, I would like to open the, the microphone for the public because uh, there might be some interactions, questions and comments that you might want to share. So if you do so, please raise your hand and don't be shy. From one side, that uh, there is some kind of investigation in South related, and on the other side, I see a kind of investigation like over a community. Uh, I know that was one of the characteristics that uh, made the two of you be together, or is a total casual situation, or I don't know, I just see a relation there, I don't know how. So, what do you think? I don't know why here, but I know that it's great actually to be in this situation because uh, there have been some very interesting discussions between me and Nicole. We didn't know each other before. So, yeah, discussions resonate with what all the inputs that we are having and the discussion we are having with the researchers. And, it's a, and I think it's a great way to experience. brings I mean, another point of view while I'm having this experience and with another with other references and the great which yeah it's very enriching and actually the, the the situation itself of not being alone in this residency it's amazing because every single moment we meet with people we see different experiments and it's mind blowing, but it's also amazing to then go together for a coffee and decompress and, and talk about it. And, and, and it's also amazing that we have very different perspectives on things. Since, as you mentioned, we, we kind of like use different materials, and, but in the end, everything also sort of resonates, which is really interesting. It's very enriching to, to have different perspectives uh, to get along, which is like really good too. Uh, yeah, it's a great experience. I think uh, one of the very powerful and the potentials of a program is to, to, to invite artists, and uh, many artists are uh, like that these days, who actually devise and create their own artifacts. 
And uh, this is especially enriching, as you say, when uh, you come to an environment in which uh, scientists and engineers do that all the time. Uh, and uh, even staff members do that as well. So we do everything. We are a very DIY uh, community. Uh, do it yourself, but also do it with others. And uh, I think uh, you understand that when you come from this uh, yeah, crafting and uh, getting you know, to learn things and, uh, and not being um, scared to use electronics or coding. Uh, and uh, I think in both of your cases, it's this. So um, I'm talking about CERN, obviously. We are thousands of people and a very large experiment and a location in the center of Europe. But you will not find that in Alma or Paraná. <laughs> Maybe more in Paraná, but in Alma the community is uh, much more smaller and uh, you will see people doing amazing stuff, but the, the, there is an inverse, uh, I would say, uh, situation there. So, um, what do you expect from that? It's not easy to go 5,000 5, meters high in the Atacama Desert and to try to devise or to control the sensors as you were in Andy. It's really hectic moving around because it will be very dizzy, there will be a time to go. So, how do you expect to manage situations and to, to, to find this resonation, resonating words in, in this remote? So, I believe that, uh, I think what's fascinating about this residency is the, the, the contrast between both places, right? Not only the scale, but as you say, the way they work, um, the environmental constraints and conditions, and uh, specifically for the, the, that, that, uh, the sonic parasite, like for example, in that video that was very playful, I was managing it and like performing a little bit with it. But the, the main idea of the poem is that it, it's by itself. So it's really revealing what's happening there. So in Alma, where it will be barely moving because of the extreme conditions of the altitude, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that it works by itself, since we won't be able to like, interact much. But I'm also hoping that, I mean, I'm not hoping, I hope it really works. But if it doesn't work, it's also part of it. And I think it's part of, the, of this whole experimentation, of, which is, Things that we've been talking a lot in, in CERN with the scientists uh, to be open for failure. I think it's super important in the type of work that we're doing. Uh, at least in my practice, it's, it's like such a key part of, of my work. And there's a lot of failure, which opens up other questions and, and just it's really enriching and, and dynamic and gives you flexible. Yeah, it's important for me. So I, I think that I really rely on this. Uh, exchanges with the researchers. So what I might hope with the Alma experience that we spend even more time with maybe less people, I don't know, I don't know if it makes any sense, or bringing uh, some discussions with the scientists. As to bounce back on this reflection of the scale of, the, of this research centers, CERN is a, it's a really big international team effort and that's also something that really touched me by being there, also understanding that some of the uh, experiments that are being undertaken are a bit tricky to even make it, organize them now, like for example uh, there is one called AMS2, which is a detector that has been put um, the, on the International Space Station in space, uh, thanks also to our collaboration with NASA. And the whole project, I mean, so it has been initiated years and years ago, I don't know exactly when, but in a period in time where the political situation is different from what is now. So now many countries that are part of this project behave differently. And that this practical dimension is also to make me reflect on my position as an artist, as an individual uh, 
having access to these uh, facilities and being there, what it means and what a, a single voice could somehow, uh, what could it bring uh, with my reflection when it's something that's been resonating in me and having, making this experience, experiencing this residency. I have a question. You, I found it very interesting you were talking a lot about how um, how scientists helped you in some sort of way or enriched your artistic practice. Did you also experience uh, disagreements with science or where they uh, were absolutely not in line with your, for instance, artistic vision? Or did you, Monica, also experience uh, failures in terms of collaborations uh, in the past? Or is it always a very harmonic kind of exchange? Which is also fine, but maybe it's also interesting. Um, I, I'm going to reply about the collaboration because I, I, I would never argue enough about the, the topic of collaboration. I think collaboration is overrated. I think uh, for um, for reaching to a collaboration point where someone uh, say, okay, I have my tools, I have my vision, I'm going to collide and interact with yours. You need to create a very long-term uh, cycle in which the conditions are optimal. And um, uh, our society, and I, I want to be very honest about, it, about this with me my, myself as a cultural uh, Produce right. Uh, our society. We are not educated in physics. So we we know very little uh, about the micro world, about the uh, fundamental particles, about the forces, about all the vocabulary that you need to engage in a very meaningful way and uh, and to be in an equal position. So uh, this equal position for me is what a collaboration uh, and. Um, one collaboration can bring a delivery of, uh, of something. But um, uh, we are in a pre-stage pre of our collaborations. So we are in the dialogue, in the engagement, in the raw uh, and uh, not product-oriented or well, delivery-oriented uh, uh, stage. Uh, we are just seeing something that uh, is also uh, Stressing the fact that we as a citizens uh, could become more uh, um, educated and uh, more engaged in a, a significant way with physics and fundamental science. So I don't expect artists and scientists to collaborate but just affect each other, uh, resonating ideas that are purely human. So the why, why is this? in this way, why do we see through glass, why do we see color, what is light, these kind of basic questions are not only uh, uh, scientific uh, approach, it's something that any of us could, might think, it's not only science, so yeah, this is a very interesting question and I like to, I always come back to the why we do this? Uh, is that collaboration or is not? Um, yeah, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. I think it's super important, interesting, and important. I, I, I would say like my formation is pretty much being a musician as a kid and playing drums with my brothers and I don't know having really bad back bands with friends. <laughs> so I kind of like. In that sense, I think that really shaped the way that I work, and even today, that it's kind of like very collaborative, and of course not all collaborations work out for different factors. Sometimes it's the people, sometimes it's the ideas, sometimes it's the material, sometimes it's the resources. It's very complex, right? But I think it is something interesting and important, and, and that I, I try to, to, to really push forward. Uh, right now, the place that I'm working and studying, uh, as I'm, I'm working as a researcher, and uh, it's very 
collaborative and it's very mixed. So there's a bunch of people from different backgrounds, uh, places, identities, uh, ideas and worlds. And, and we sort of come together in these laboratories where it doesn't really matter if you're like a scientist or an artist, but things are going to merge together. And the most different voices that you have in this group, the, the, as diverse the, 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 the perspectives are, uh, really you can see how they enrich the conversations on really hardcore science or, or, or really, like these are like the two extremes in the place that I work, uh, that it's under the umbrella of media arts and sciences. So it's like you have in one side a really hard sciences and the other side a art. So what's in between is everything that is happening and emerging, but even in both extremes, you can see the importance of having all these people in the conversation and, and yeah, having a voice in these topics. Yeah, I think there are multiple ways in which arts uh, could relate to science, and vice versa, or influence each other somehow. There are many, many yeah, different cases. Um, yeah, what I've been experiencing here during this residency um, has been quite interesting because I've been also asking like, the same question uh, to different researchers and also seeing and observing the reactions. That could be also deceiving or exciting or just simply changing the way I perceive things and even realizing my work from a different perspective or, yeah, a question of also what I've been doing from, yeah, from, from which perspective I'm, I'm analyzing things. And, yeah, this, now for sure it's not. At the collaboration level, it's more like an exploratory <laughs> tourist level somehow. Even though um, I've been like asking questions like a child, and it's like a great privilege somehow to be in that situation. And at the same time, engage in a discussion, it's not just a monologue, but really ping pong somehow things and making sense of reality somehow by its own means, and, yeah. Yeah, I just would like to add that I think that really these type of residences or opportunities to put these different perspectives in, in conversation, in dialogue, are fundamental for, not only for us as artists, like I had a conversation one day with a friend and she was like, oh, it's amazing for you guys as an artist to go on and talk to the scientists and play to the science for a little bit. And it's like, wow, how can you say that? Like, it's like, it's not about that. Like, I think when we understand things as polarized as that, that's the problem. And we should try to build a, like, really, really systems that are more in dialogue and less fragmented. Okay, so, uh, is there a, no. another question? It was just also a hint that Ella and I are serving drinks back there, so we were all locked into for a small apple. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the drinks. <laughs> it's very hot. <laughs> it's very warm here. Thank you very much and uh, stay tuned as uh, the residency is uh, still going on and the second stage, as I said, is uh, super exciting. So we will be sending out signals from the Atacama Desert. Thank you. Thank you.